welcome to another episode of Steady Lads. We have a great one for you today. So uh, joining me is Thicky, the junior analyst at Scimitar Capital. Some people have promoted you, Thicky. We'll, we'll have to correct the Wu blockchain so, uh, shortly. We have Taiki, the, the humble farmer and uh, lover, lover of uh, RWAs recently, it seems. <laughs> And uh, Justin Bram, who is the CEO of Astaria and I would say the trier of SocialFi apps. I try everything. So I wanted to uh, kick off with Alameda. I think it's hard not to, given the, the trial that's going on right now. We, we've seen Carolyn. She's been probably the, the star witness. Unless we get a, you know, Trabuco showing, that might take the spotlight away. But as of, as of this uh, recording right now, we haven't seen any evidence of that yet. Uh, Justin, have you been following this closely? I have, yeah. So I finished the Michael Lewis book. We can talk a little bit about that. And I've also been following along a little bit with um, this account here, Inner City Press, which live tweets things from the trial, basically like a abbreviated or abridged transcript, you could say, of everything happening. And um, some of the information that's coming from these witnesses is shocking. And I, I do tend to believe them. Uh, one, they're under oath. And two, their deals with the government will basically be ripped apart and they'll go through the whole legal process without any sort of support from the government for pleading guilty if they lie. So I do tend to believe them. And uh, I think one of the most shocking revelations for me, I mean, there's a ton in there, but um, Caroline basically has this quote where she says that Sam was obsessed with this. I think it comes from poker, actually, this concept of expected value, basically that you always want to be modeling out you know, where you'll get the best return from at any cost. Um, now, typically in the investing world, that sort of makes sense. But it seems like Sam, uh, SBF took it sort of to like this extreme that I would almost call like a mental dysfunction. So he <laughs> is quoted saying he would flip a coin. And if there's a 51% chance it lands on heads and a 49% chance it lands on tails, if in heads, the productivity of the world doubled and tails the world was destroyed. He would flip that coin every time. And so this is like your... Let me actually correct you. It's not even exactly correct. So he thinks that even if it was 50-50, he would still flip it. The thinking being that if you keep flipping these coins as like a reverse martingale, uh, you can potentially get like an exponentially high outcome. Well, the, the downside is limited. The downside is just zero. Like the world goes to zero. But the upside is like unlimited, is, is like infinite if you keep uh, doubling down. So even if it's 50-50, he is saying that um, he would keep flipping. And then just for the audience, Martingale is a strategy, I think, in roulette where like if you always double your bet size on, say, red or black, and you can always double even if you lose, like eventually he'll come out on top. Is that right? You double only when you lose. Justin, I, I, I think our, our DGEN audience is very familiar with Martingale. I think Thicky's been... Uh, <laughs> Doing a lot of martingale on losses they, they must have been uh experienced with that with, with trading well it took a second to click with me so i don't know i'm just trying to trying to be the side of the on the side of the audience the voice for the people yeah whenever i go to vegas i would always martingale with my friends like on roulette with like a max loss of like a few thousand dollars but if i win the first time it's like okay like we're out <laughs> so if you can imagine a reverse martingale basically means there's a little chance you get out of the casino with your money but that one time that you do, you know, you own the casino. That's sort of what, what SPF uh, is going for here. And we saw this tweets during the bull market, you know, when people had their testosterone high because their little altcoins were still up in the sky. They were talking about linear wealth versus log wealth. And, you know, a bunch of the, uh, at the time, billionaires were one-upping each other about how linear their wealth preference is instead of, instead of logarithmic. And we can talk about this. What, can you explain, Thicky, this utility function of, of what log versus linear means? Yeah, well, I think like the typical way of how people think about wealth is that like every additional dollar you get means less. So like going from zero dollars to 100K, let's say, is like very meaningful, but maybe going from 100K to a million is less meaningful, a million to 10 million, even less meaningful. And at a certain point, like the marginal dollar is just worth less. So there's like a log scale to it. But um, I guess the more linear wealth you are, like the, the less, you know, a dollar is a dollar, no matter how much you have. Um, so that's kind of the mindset that was adopted in the bull market. This sort of philosophy is quite interesting. So during the bull market, a lot of people that were trying to push this narrative of being chads were saying that, you know, we don't care about log linear, you know, we're just, we're just, they're like the reverse of Taiki as personalities, you know, full on, 
I'm going, going wild. <laughs> it's a good thing, honestly. The, so I have a high tolerance for like shady people, you know, gamblers. I've been around all these kind of people. I have a certain amount of respect for, you know, someone that's just trying to make it and, and hustling. The people that I can't stand are the people that have made, like they're billionaires and they're just totally fraudulent at that level. And I'm talking about the Mashinskys and the SBFs and these guys that they've made it, you know, they can, they can take a chill pill. They don't need to like push the boundaries of what's legal and screw everybody else. Those are the people that I just can't forgive. Like, I don't know. It just irks me to no end. Well, that's sort of the point I, I was talking about this sort of like, uh, it, it really does feel like SBF had like some sort of, I don't know what personality disorder it would be, but like to take these things to the extreme when like, to your point, he had an amazing, actually not an amazing business. We can get into that later, but he had a business that <laughs> he would never have to worry about money again, let's just say. Right. And he had to, he felt the need to take this to the extreme to accumulate as much money as humanly possible, even though he knew that the risk would be complete ruin. And he made this EV calculation in his head that, Maybe on paper you can make the case for, but just any rational human would come in and look at this and say, this is not the right thing to do. I shouldn't take this risk on. Because ultimately he was just betting that his bets would win and he would be able to come out of this alive, right? Like he just took customer money thinking that he there's a more than 50% chance he would win. And it, it just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I think the mental disease or whatever uh, situation is, is probably related to the, those like drugs that he would you know, pump himself full of patches and stuff to get going. And, you know, you add that to a very healthy dose of autism, which is not rare in the space, but he definitely, you know, had, had his share of it. I don't know if you, did you see the story where he's on a call with, um, you know, some, some VCs or something. Is it, is, was it, uh, which large VC was it that he was on Sequoia. a call? It was a Sequoia. Sequoia. Yeah. yeah. You know, supposed to be one of the most sophisticated in, in the space and they all just fall in love with him in the chats. 10 out of 10. I want to, Let's go with this guy. Yes. Like he's, his vision. And then meanwhile, they're saying he was like playing League of Legends on the side. And that sounds like he's an incredible genius. Like he's able to multitask and at the same time, you know, convince the most difficult VC to, to convince. But then, you know, we know that he's a, a complete uh, like bronze B minus, like C minor player at League of Legends. So. He's a very, uh, you know, super smart, but also super stupid at the same time. Uh, intelligence. It's a very strange one, strange combination. Yeah, I think uh, in sentencing, like the thing that from, you know, I, like I said, I've read the Michael Lewis book. I've been following the trial pretty closely. I think what the judge is really going to hammer him on when he so like at the end of a trial, right, when it's time for sentencing, the judge almost always gives like a speech, right, of like five minutes saying, you know, here are the reasons why I'm going to give you many years. Here are the reasons why I'm going to give you a few years. And my interpretation and also seeing how the judge has been reacting is that the judge is going to say, you're a very smart person. Like you could have done so much good for the world. Like this, this makes this even more tragic. There's so many people that don't have the opportunity to go to the best schools in the world like you do to be educated by great parents on a university campus. And you took that and you sort of twisted it and it became this like terrible manifestation where you hurt a lot of people. And I think that's what's going to be used against him during sentencing if he's found guilty. Have any of you like interacted with um, EA people, effective altruism people? You know, there's some prominent ones in crypto, but um, I've lived in the Bay. I think Taiki, you lived in the Bay as well, but maybe you weren't going to as many uh, shady parties in Berkeley as, as I was at the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately not, or fortunately. Um, I know, um, who, who's the guy that runs Dragonfly? Hasib? I think Hasib, he's also yeah. like an effective altruist, right? Um, yeah, definitely like SVF gave EA like a really bad rap. Um, I'm not even sure if he actually believed in it. Maybe, you know, if he kept talking about like the coin flip situation, you know, he just took it to an extreme. Um, like, what do you guys think about like EA? Uh, like, do you think it's, it makes sense or is it more like, an excuse yeah. for people to like just try to like extract value. No, it makes sense. I mean, I've been around this world, you know, some of my best friends were, are maybe still um, in that community. It's a very small community. I, li I literally didn't realize, but a lot of them were like working at Alameda. Apparently it's such a small circle that 
you know, they were just hiring from from within it. So just knowing people within it, you, you probably know people that were behind the scenes working there, at least during like the early years, 18, 19, those, those type of years uh, before they like there was a split and a bunch of people left. But um, no, it's a legitimate thing. I would say it appeals to a certain intellect that super logical, you know, the Jane Street type, they're, they're able to like, you know, think very cleanly and, and that's great. But uh, there's certain assumptions they make about the world in order to be able to simplify it into their equations. And those assumptions are usually not exactly um, fair to make. Like, let's say they're obsessed with what's the cheapest amount of money uh, to save a life. And it's like mosquito nets in Africa. Okay, like we should we should just do this. And the simplification is all lives are worth the same. And we should just try to maximize like lives as a concept and this assumption is, is quite incorrect in my view. Like if you actually do like trolley problems and you go into like deeper philosophical things, you know, it's not just the pure number of lives, like, you know, the circumstances, the ages, like so many things matter. Uh, in my opinion, like, you know, the consciousness level uh, of, of somebody also also matters. Like if someone's like an NPC character, um, you know, may, maybe it's, it's like not, not as valuable as someone like Socrates. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I think um, so. I, I'm, you know, I, I don't know any EAs, but like from my understanding of it, I don't hold like I, I don't see it as a necessarily bad belief system. But I think the concept of effective altruism really removes the human element to your point. And I think by removing the human element of sort of just trying to maximize good as opposed to targeting good where you see where you think there's the most need, it leads to this sort of like dehumanization that I think happened with SBF. So I don't necessarily think he was trying to steal this money for personal gain. And like, we actually saw that because he was donating to politicians. And of course, that gave him some influence. But if he spent 100 million on politicians, clearly, he could get more positive benefit by just spending 100 million on himself. And he didn't do that. But I think this effective altruism shield allowed him to dehumanize his customers and realize that taking money from customers would lead to a greater good because he could spend it in a better way than his customers would. And he could also possibly make a positive return. So I think, you know, there's ways to take everything to the extreme. And if you have this effective altruist shield, it allows you to do things like stealing from one person to spend it on someone in need, right? Like the question of if Robin Hood is good for the world, uh, the idea of taking from the rich to give to the poor. I agree. I mean, I think the morality can get skewed. Um, there's always benefits to this type of thinking because sometimes when it when it does align and it fits in, uh, it makes sense. And we saw that with the anthropic investment. I think having known the history of EAs and, and being you know very close to that community, I know that was it around tw 2017, like quite a few years ago, they were doing all these programs and all these different things. You know, they were running uh, camps in SF, and at some point they just said. We're shutting everything down. We're only going to focus on AI risk. And we think like this is like the one thing that humanity like can maximize, you know, like the EV of, of our time is, is best spent on, on AI risk. And a lot of them have done a great job in that space. And even this like, you know, what looked like very stupid investment in an anthropic, you know, no name startup has obviously paid off very well and can potentially make uh, investors whole. But, you know, Kudos, kudos for, uh, you know, at least let's, let's talk about some of the good things about, uh, about that culture, but let's go back to the bad stuff. So thank you. Can you, uh, bring up this chart? We have this chart of, um, they're, they're, they're putting together what they think is like the real PL of Alameda. Okay. So you're the, you're the trader here. Maybe you can kind of line up with Luna and some of the other things and, and we can try to figure out what was going on here. I don't know if we can zoom into some of the dates and, and, uh, so it looks like from there, there was like a pretty monstrous Luna run from you know to January to April 2022, and there was also like a pretty decent Soul rally from like I think like 80 bucks to 140 um, in March and April. So that ties out with like those spikes. They actually got back to even. It looks like at the peak of Soul. Like, as a trader, when you see that you, you know oh we were down seven eight billion, but we got back to even. Next time you're willing to risk even more, right? Because you're like, well, you know, we can we can make it back. <laughs> exactly. And then you see that spike from four billion to twelve billion uh, negative, coinciding with the Luna implosion. Do you think this was like absorbing liquidations on FTX, and that they just they just kept bidding uh, on FTX, or um, maybe it's just 
they had too much Luna? Or what do you think it is? I'm not sure. I, I think I think it could be a combination of the both. That does seem to be like the prevailing um, consensus thought. Just a question for you guys, though. The, these aren't uh, like these are. This is the real P and L, but these this includes like tokens that are too illiquid to actually sell at the market price, right? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. If you look at the source, it goes like database tables, binary option fills, uh, referral rebates, fee voucher deductions, a lot of interesting things that they're count- airdrops. But the the final number doesn't line up, so I I, w- I would guess that this is quite an accurate like net representation of what was going on, and. It's interesting, like after the Luna implosion, they made back like $4 billion, And this is around the time that, you know, Three Arrows was saying that they were getting counter traded and somebody was trying to liquidate them. Um, no, that's true. I don't, good point. I, don't, I don't know if that's what's, you know, when they were making some of it back. In that level of desperation, I imagine like they, you know, they were willing to just throw out the book, right? Just, just go full on, full on ham. What happened at the very end in November, there was like a spike from minus 10 to six soul spiked in, into breakpoint and then that weekend soul gotcha. actually from like 20 something to like 37 so it was very good for them until it died no, that's a good <laughs> theory though Cody, that like maybe they decided to hunt the ac because they were so in the red you know sue did say um he was one of the first people to say that um he thinks alameda was absor- absorbing liquidations uh during luna and at least these numbers would line up with with some of his speculation about about them. Plus, the I think I was the first one to speculate that uh, publicly that they had a non non liquidation account that could probably go very negative, and that also turned out to be correct. So some of the uh, some of the guesses are, are being validated by by the data we're seeing. When you say uh, absorbing losses, do you mind just explaining what you mean by that? If people have like a two x three x Luna position and Luna's going down as it was crashing really hard. Somebody needs to liquidate that. So you can either just sell it into the book on behalf of the user. But what these exchanges do, like most of the large ones actually, like they'll have a, a separate feed that the liquidations go into. And instead of throwing them into the book, they can just put them on their own sub account. They, they can just have a sub account that just gets all the liquidations. And Alameda was quite public saying for years that these are, you know, some of the times they make the most money because they're willing to be on the other side of liquidations because it's usually forced selling and it'll kind of bounce back up, right? Like you'll, you'll have this like spike down 20% and then it'll, it'll go back up 10%. So it'll, it'll make that spread. But in Luna's case, it just kept going down and down and down and down and they're absorbing these things. And I think Sue might have kind of hit the nail on the head as to some of these losses. Obviously, you know, they actually did have VC investments in Luna as well and potentially had UST. So um, it could be a combination of things. Cool. So let, let's go in, on to like a different topic while, you know, this this trial plays out. I'm sure we'll, we'll have some more to talk about next week. I think, uh, you know, the other thing that happened was Stars Arena getting kind of hacked and then the next day, like actually hacked. And then we're seeing a few more things with AVAX uh, recently with Platypus. So, you know, th- this was something that I felt quite shocked by, not the actual initial hacking because, okay, you know, um, EVM contracts, like, you know, shit happens, but the, the reaction initially of saying that this was all FUD and then when it actually happened. So you see like this tweet here by Emin who, you know, had decided to align himself fully with, uh, with this app, this protocol. What did you think when you, uh, when you guys saw this? Yeah, definitely like tone deaf. Right. Um, and I feel like Ava labs and like avalanche and like all these alt L1 foundations, um, they all suffer from lack of relevance. Um, and whenever something catches on, they kind of have to pile in, right? Just try to make themselves relevant. And I think the entire Ava Labs team was like, you know what? Like, this is our chance, right? Like, Frontex doing well on base. Stars Arena just launched. Let's just, you know, pile money into this. Uh, we'll promise some AVAX incentives down the line. Um, and then, like, when the, hacks hap- when, when the hack happens, um, they're like, oh, well, like, oh, fuck. Like, w- like, what do we do now? Like, we already publicly backed it. So... They kind of have to, like they're kind of stuck, right? They're like they're kind of like bag holding uh, their public opinion around a particular platform, um, and it's kind of hard to go back. Um, and I think Emin maybe was acting out of emotional, uh, did like an emotional response of you know what, like you know, three million dollars, like that's no big deal. Like Stars Arena can make it back in you know like two weeks or whatever. He, he did have an emotional reaction because he was saying like this is a war against us. You know, we're being fighted. This is like a tribal thing. He, he used the word tribal, 
So he's viewing it, you know, back into the, uh, you know, I remember the, uh, I've abandoned the Ethereum and then, you know, people yeah. attacking Sue for, for going with AVAX <laughs> and going back to those days. But I don't think that this is what's happening. And the, the, the comment about 3 million not being a lot it was just so shocking to me as a, as a lack of like uh, awareness as, as to, you know, like what matters in this space. And like you said, Teiki, I, I, I completely agree with you. Like these chains are they're trying to grab a narrative. It's hard to get attention. It hasn't been going that well. You know, it's been a, it's been a rough bear market and any glimmer of hope they'll jump on. But, you know, now that, I mean, you know, I'm in the arena as well. I, I have the same role with Mantle where we have these apps come in and I have to decide, like, are we, you know, are we going to just start pumping them to everybody and, and officially supporting them? Like we have Fantech, which is is like Stars Arena. It's like a friend tech fork on Mantle. And I've been in the exact position that Admin has where, you know, I, I get like squeezed from different sides. Like why, you know, why don't we just like publicly support? And I take the, you know, I have another uh, stuffed animal, stuffed animal of the week. This is the sloth. <laughs> I, you know, it's my spirit animal for the week. I've been taking the, the slow approach. And, you know, I want to have teams KYC'd and I want to have smart contracts verified at the minimum and audited before just publicly telling, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to put money here. And I just found it so shocking that the approach here was, hey, guys. It's all FUD. And then the next day he's proven wrong. It's not all FUD. Like there's no security. Even if... <laughs> And then it's like, oh, it's just 3 million guys. Like other people lost more. Why does this happen to ecosystem leaders? Like across the board, I think every single ecosystem leader besides Vitalik, and I'm, this isn't even to toot Vitalik's horn, but like he, he just doesn't get involved in this stuff. But every single ecosystem leader sort of turns into this like crazed, biased promoter at all costs like are we going to see that with you jordy in a in a year when mantle is uh like a top ecosystem coin no man uh <laughs> i am taking a very different approach here i you know this is the singaporean government approach we're gonna hell yeah we're gonna be safe you know ultimately like you you want to have in people's head no like hacks and no like huge issues people want to feel safe with money and you know this is a financial instrument it's like number one thing is security for me so uh, you can't control every single thing, you know, something might happen, especially with, with EVM, but you can control at least like the basics And here. It wasn't even like near the basics. So, um, I mean, in, in terms of other leaders, maybe we should bring up some of the other alt L1 chains and, and see, you know, what's been going on. I think we haven't heard about them in so long. <laughs> we used yeah. to uh, look at these people every day during the bull market, but now, you know, the Silvios and the. I think Charles Hoskinson hasn't, you know, he, he's been. He has like a private jet business. <laughs> Very profitable. No, no, no. He's been, uh, he uh, helped recover um, like non elements, not from this universe at the bottom of the sea. Very interesting. I do think that like crypto projects are more so, the successful ones more so rely on like cultism rather than actual technology. And I think that's the reason why you see all these fanatic leaders emerge to the top, like Do Kwan. Um, that kind of, you know, personality type. Yeah. People want someone to follow, right? It's like Danny, like Frog Nation, even SVF, um, and even Evan, right? Like maybe he feels like the need to, you know, just start bull posting, um, get engagement. Uh, cause like, that's the only way to get people's attention. Um, and there's like no real way to like no efficient way to value these cryptocurrencies. So in order for your coin to get buyers, you know, you, you just have to be on top of like Twitter or like whatever social media platform. Um, and I think founders have to like account for that. No, I mean, that's, that's the game. There's no exact way to value an alt L1, like a layer one coin. Maybe there are some gas fees, but it, usually those are very much distant into the future. So apart from Ethereum, that is actually, you know, usually generating quite a lot of gas fees. The other ones are relying on the community aspect. And we've talked about community money a little bit in the past. A lot of these things, are trying to build this community. And we're in the paleo Paleolithic times here with crypto. People don't realize that the most important thing for community money is the supply. And it's just completely underestimated how like constant supply and dumping from insiders will 
just rip apart the community because the community is together because they're feeling the vibes. They want to get rich together. This is like our caveman vibes. But if there's just like supply coming in, this is like the number one reason why all of these are failing and will keep failing, in my opinion. Uh, maybe we can bring up the get a coin gecko maybe to see where where some of these coins have been trading. So okay, Polkadot. This was one that had a lot of hype. Obviously, you know, one of the co-founders of Ethereum, and there's multiple chains where the the co whether one of the co-founders of Ethereum. It looks pretty rough. Uh, this is this is not even a linear chart, so it's even worse than it looks. And this is a BTC chart, so it's already reflecting the the beta of the market. Doesn't look like a happy community, and um, I think we have a tweet up by by Wu Blockchain uh, saying that a, a certain analyst was uh, was pointing out some layoffs that are happening here. So analyst Thicky revealed that Parity Technologies, the Polkadot ecosystem development organization, laid off three hundred people. So. Uh, good scoop there, Thiggy. Um, <laughs> is that I, I real? Not, is that a real scoop? It's a real scoop. I don't know if it's your scoop, but earlier this week, Parity <laughs> launched like a thread that said that like, you know, we don't want to be a bottleneck to the ecosystem, so we're going to pivot from go-to-market functions to developer. I don't know. This is like very much like crypto corporate speak, and it's like very much like no one has any idea what these people are saying. And they also announced like a foundation. Um, like grant program for new developers. I believe it was like 20 million Swiss francs and like 5 million dots. It's around like another $20 million of dot. So like I, I quote tweeted it and I was like, what's actually going on here? Like it, it reads very much like they're shutting down the entire service provider. And um, for the readers that aren't aware, most of these crypto projects have like a foundation structure, which is like the legal wrapper for the DAO. And then they have like the service provider who usually is like, you know, the people that wrote the source code and, they maybe push updates and contribute to the project itself. Um, so the service provider, I was like, is it just shutting down or something? And then someone, one of the uh, employees DMs me and was like, hey, yeah, like I just got laid off. Um, 300 other employees got laid off. It's like 70, 80% of the entire workforce. Um, so yeah, they were not very happy about what happened. And um, yeah, I was just, I was just kind of surprised that like, this is the way that I thought they were going like, to follow up with something, but yeah, this is the way that they're going to announce it. It's in, it's like a game of obfuscation, right? Like with, uh, I mean, I keep going back to Cardano, but it's like in crypto is the only industry where you can exit to the world without actually delivering on anything. Right. So like Cardano, like goes public with the AD, with the ADA, ADA token, whatever it is. And there's literally no incentive for anyone to participate in continuing development. In fact, it's actually probably worse. Like when we saw Cardano in the bull market um, launch smart contracts, which I, I think failed. I'm not exactly sure what happened with that. That was literally the top, right? So like these, all of these events are sell the news because these ecosystems can't deliver any real value. So if Polkadot actually started announcing that they were building things, people would see that that actually had no effect and they would all become sell the news. So it's much better, like from a Polkadot company standpoint, to not build, to slim the team down to as little as possible, but to have their like eccentric leader, is that Gavin Wood in this case, like continue to shill Polkadot, be a spokesman for it. And if he executes well on that, Polkadot price action will be more positive than actually building. So to me, this is just like how our incentives are aligned in the ecosystem. And it it is disappointing to see that like everyone becomes billionaires without actually delivering anything. But So you have technology and there's some that have better technology than others, you know, arguably like Algorand, you know, some people were saying that the tech is actually, you know, pretty good. Maybe like in terms of like the, you know, blockchain trilemma, there's some progress made on, on that front, but lacking in several other ways, clearly. And ultimately we, we see Cosmos maybe still, you know, having a community and DYDX is potentially going to bring something interesting there. We, we've had some, uh, some good chains, use that environment. And I think that's one that has a, you know, potentially some, some chance AVAX, I think, you know, we, we, we've kind of seen some of the, uh, the recent effects and don't want to comment further, but, um, Solana is an interesting one and that's been debated a little bit back and forth. I think there was an interesting, uh, thread. Maybe we can bring up, um, maybe it's more on the trading side, less, less 
less philosophical, but it all ties in together. So this DeFi squared thread, he's been talking about this for a while. Um, have you been reading these, Thicky? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I talked to DeFi squared a little bit. And um, yeah, he's not very bullish or not very bearish soul. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I took the short on too, but from a much lower price point, it, it seemed like very obvious that like, oh, there's a huge overhang going on. But like, there, you know, it, it's very much like a fan favorite token, and like, there was no supply coming in the near term, so like, it definitely squeezed up very high, like twenty four dollars. Do you, do you still feel comfortable like shorting this thing when it? This seems to me like the most crowded trade in all of crypto right now, and most discussed. Like everyone knows that with the bankruptcy, there's a ton of soul that has to get liquidated like i'm obviously not a trader i leave that to you guys but like for me i'd be terrified of being in on this because everyone in the world is thinking about this everyone in the crypto world i should say so it depends how you execute right like if you um if you have spot you can just sell spot if you have some calendar future or some uh, put option then you don't have to worry about liquidations and I think it's just the clearest trade, and I, I kind of agree with DeFi Square. The the amount of selling pressure into this type of liquidity and this type of market, people just hugely underestimate what it can potentially do. And we don't know the timing, so that's where it gets risky. Like if you if you put on a perps position and the funding goes negative and you're getting squeezed, that's what we saw um, or last month. But it's inevitable that we we'll, we will see a lot lower price once Genesis uh, Galaxy, sorry, starts selling. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's inevitable that the price will be much lower from here. Just like the short term, there's some positioning games going on. And um, yeah, I mean, 24 was a good short. Like it's it's at like what 21 right now. Just um to question you guys on that or play devil's advocate a bit. So it's it looks like it's it's about a billion dollars worth of soul. Uh, could someone like Anatoly to you know quote unquote save soul like we saw with Curve and Mitch? like be interested i mean uh, presumably he's a billionaire he must have sold a ton of soul at the top like could someone like him just come in and backstop soul and buy that all of that otc i mean what are your guys thoughts there you know i, I imagine these founders sell thumb tokens and, and they buy like a, a house or two but i don't think that they get liquid a billion dollars and I, I saw both of you two chuckling over there like you you know something I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, even with Mitch, right? Like he was scrambling and, and begging to get like 50 bucks. Um, so I don't, I don't think a billion dollars is, uh, is gettable right now. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that guy's a billionaire. Um, and I think this is what they said before. It's like, there's like not enough money in the, in crypto to price these things effectively. Uh, maybe in like a bull market, you know, there's like enough liquidity for OTC deals. Um, but is it really reasonable? Like even at, at like a 50% discount, like is there $600 million worth of money willing to buy Seoul? I, I, I really don't see that. But but just to be clear, so when Seoul peaked and obviously Anatoly would, couldn't have sold the peak, but it peaked at about $80 billion FDV, I can guarantee with certainty, well, I can't, but like let's just say he owned 5% of the token supply, which I think is actually quite conservative just given my thoughts. Like let's assume he owned 5% or even 1%, right? Like he, he would have exited quite a bit during the bull market and could certainly acquire like a large portion of that soul if he wanted to. Now, I don't necessarily think he should do that if I were him or he's incentivized to, but I'm just saying theoretically, like he has the capital to do it. I don't, so, so soul is like 70 billion, right? At its peak. So even if he had 1% and like sold the Pico top and got no, um, you slippage, then that, that's only 700 million. And, and like, it's really hard for these people with like huge, oh, also like most of his soul is locked. So I think most of his wealth is denominated in locked soul. And I, I really do think that like more so the VCs and Alameda were able to sell the top rather than like the team and the, the yeah, the founders. Yeah, there's definitely like some 3-3 situation going on where all the participants are trying to not to sell when it's, when it's actually going well. Um, they're mm -hmm. actually probably more likely to sell after there's, a crash and then a little bit of a correction. So probably the most selling happened when it went from, you know, 300 to 50 and then went back to like 80 for a while, 80, 90. That's probably when the uh, VCs start realizing that they've had a crash. Like, you know, I've seen this like countless times with, with psychology where you feel invincible because you're at these all time highs and it just keeps pumping. So no, you don't sell, you don't sell there. And then it crashes like, you know, 
60, 70, 80, 90%, and you get a little bit of a respite and you're like, okay, okay, okay. Like now I'm going to sell. So probably at around a hundred dollars, some people were selling. There's talks that Multicoin and, and Kyle Samani was actually buying more there, which um, probably has made some people unhappy on the, on the LP side. But uh, I would imagine <laughs> that that's probably where most of the exiting would have happened. Yeah, I feel like it's it's more socially acceptable for team members to sell after a correction, right? You never want, like, as a founder, you never want to sell the top because then people will like hate you for it. But you know, if you sell thirty percent lower, then you know, like it, it's okay. Uh, so I think there's also like social elements of crypto that um, founders have to deal with when like trying to exit tokens. The I mean. The, this in in this case, I don't necessarily agree with the social piece. Like, there's no doubt in my mind, Anatoly could like at the time, like he could have sold a huge tranche to Genesis OTC, and Genesis would have confidentially found buyers for that. Like that was happening. I feel like all of the time in the bull market with DeFi founders. But I, I definitely take your the three of your guys's points that like there's no way he perfectly timed the top, and even if he did, he probably doesn't have enough money that he would throw it all into buying soul and sort of like doubling down at this point. And I'll mention one more thing. Like, why would you even buy it? Um, like, why would you step in? Why not just let whoever is liquidating, you know, in this case, Galaxy for the estate, let them just hit whatever air bids, let them push it down. And then you can always, if you have dry capital, you can you can use it to, to pop the price back after. There is no reason to step in front of like this train. And the, all these yeah. like Solana community people, you know, I love them. And amazing, you know, you guys have great vibes and great colors and great NFTs, and and that's all amazing. <laughs> Why would you want to like throw your financial life in front of like, you know, an oncoming train? Just let the train go through, and then you can, you, you know, it'll still potentially rebound. Like even if it goes down to like a single digit altcoin, um, I can I can see it in two three years if the community sticks together, maybe getting over it, but amount of sell pressure that's unlocking for years and years it just destroys the concept of community money in my eyes it, it destroys the ability for cavemen to get excited and coordinate to build wealth together and i think um this is going to be a painful lesson that will we'll get slowly realized do you feel the same way around like dydx because a similar unlock is going to happen in december uh where you know, the circulating supply of DYDX is, you know, it's going to increase significantly. Uh, of course, the fundamentals, I mean, they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to launch, uh, launch V4 this month, allegedly. Uh, there's going to be staking rates. Um, like, how do you think about, like, these unlock events? And, like, is it worth trading around them? Or do you, like, just let the train come and then just pick up the pieces after? I don't think DYDX is community money. It's a, it's a much more of a financial application, you know, looking at cash flows, what's an exchange worth and there's VCs and there, there's liquid funds. Um, I don't think the unlock is going to be sold because the backers that they have are very well chosen. And this is another point about Solana. This is like, you know, I don't want to get comments about being a Solana hater. You know, I, I used to own a lot of Solana and I still like a lot of things around Solana, but the fact that they chose the wrong backers and they chose Samani, they chose SPF, this will haunt them for a very long time. And you look at who who did the IDX choose? Yeah, like there's a few three arrows coins that you know maybe I'll try to buy OTC, no uh, NFA, but um, <laughs> no, you you have Paradigm, Polychain, you have like the biggest funds that are in good place. They have multi billion of AUM still. I don't think they're like looking to to immediately dump, and I don't I don't expect them to to do that. One other thing about DYDX that makes this like something almost impossible to bet on is they've pushed back the unlocks also historically. So like during the bear market, they they I think they just completely moved the unlock by like a year, right? And like theoretically, they could easily do that again if they wanted to. So yeah. I think the idea was move it until B4 goes live because then the token will actually have utility and people will uh, you know want to hold it for some reason. So the unlock is supposed to happen in December. I mean, that's the stated... That's what's stated publicly, right? But it, the, the actual reason behind it could be just we're in a bear market. Like presumably if DYDX was hitting all-time highs, they would have allowed trading and not wanted to wait for V4 or whatever they're calling their new app. I mean, we're seeing the same thing. You know, bear market yeah. means you need, a, yeah. you need a good story or, or a good catalyst, right? So it's the same thing. Um, I'm curious what you guys think about AVAX. So they're 
uh, sorry, not AVAX, Arbitrum, uh, enough about AVAX. So Arbitrum <laughs> has had uh, this grant program where they've had 100 plus applications from all the different apps and each one has submitted a proposal, which is a very weird game theory thing because they have to say how many tokens they're going after and there's not that many tokens. So it actually doesn't make sense. I'm not exactly sure what the lessons are going to be once we look back, but there's just been these random proposals and people say, I think I'm worth 14 million because I'm GMX and okay, I'll just take 1 million, but 1 million is higher than your you know entire like TVL. There's mm-hmm. just a bunch of stuff going on and it gets very political. The people who have the tokens are not necessarily voting on merit, they're voting on their friends and it creates a temporary demand for the token. But once the voting is over, and once those, uh, I think it's 50 million ARB that's going out, you know, those are going to get farmed and, and potentially dumped. So, I mean, Vicky, have you been, I, I'm pretty sure you have your eyes on this. You're, you're always close to the uh, Arbitrum community loves you uh, from the day of your initial proposal there. <laughs> what do you think about what's going on there? Yeah, I, I haven't trading it that much. Um, I, I do think it's like bullish for the projects and probably slightly, you know, adds just more supply for Arbitrum. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've always kind of had some disdain towards this grant sort of setup just because, you know, it's kind of just like a popularity contest, like a political thing. It's like very much like who, you know, in the foundation too. And I don't know, it's just not like a game I like to play. So. Taiki, do you think this is just a value transfer from from the chain to the apps and what ends up happening there? Yeah, I, I actually think that like the Arbitrum DAO is like, this is like a 50 million token extra experiment and there's like setting up the infrastructure for voting to happen. And then maybe in 2024, they can do like a 500 million incentive. And then, you know, like people won't be scrambling to, you know, go through all the politics and whatnot. Um, like, I don't really think any Arbitrum alts should be bid for this, I mean, sure, TBL might go up for like two months, but you know, most of these projects are like dead on arrival, so it's not really going to save them. Um, like, I am in the camp of okay, like maybe I'll farm some, maybe keep you know farming, accumulate some R, but like I have no desire to like you know buy all these. And like most of these tokens are going to like perp dexes. Um, I think it's more productive if Arbitrum just gave a bunch to GMX because like that's their flagship product. It's like if they give. I don't know, like a few million dollars to like Grail or Camelot. Like, it's like it doesn't really move the needle. Um, but you know, like I'm not really against it. Um, I'm not bullish any of these tokens, to be honest. Um, but I, I think it's more of like an experiment uh, before they prepare for like the next bull run. As an experiment, I think it's interesting. Like Justin says, you know, just try stuff. Let's see how it goes. I think it's not perfectly designed. No, nobody's going to be able to argue that it is. But you do have to give them credit for like making that conscious choice of. Like their FDV, I just was looking at it. It's about $8 billion now, which uh, seems like a lot. But, you know, who knows? That's what the market's valuing it at. And I, I mean, I give them credit for like accepting guaranteed sell pressure to like, while well, FDV is so high, they sort of deliver that to apps. I know, Jordi, you're with Mandel, you're taking like a huge app first approach and trying to promote an ecosystem. So like I, I give them credit for trying. Uh, it sounds like the execution's not the best, but. It's not even as far as optimism took it. I remember, you know, they, they were just giving retroactive grants to DAC XPT and nice community members. So, you know, <laughs> they, they, they went full, like, you know, here, just take tokens. Um, it's a different approach and, and we'll see what happens. I mean, on the optimism plus side, they, they did show that there was a bid. They managed to sell a ton of it OTC uh, without touching the books. So, um, yeah, we'll see how it plays out. And, uh, you know, normally we have a closing segment, like a pasta of the week. This week, I have been like laughing my ass off on some of the memes on crypto Twitter. So we're changing up a little bit. We're going to do a keck of the week. So uh, let's look at some of the memes. What's everybody's favorite memes been this week? So uh, this had this tweet had me in stitches. I was I was really cracking up. And it, I think that this is real news, too. So uh, from coming out of Blockworks. Um, it looks like the beloved grocery store Trader Joe's. Um, if you're based in the States, you're definitely familiar with it. Pe- people love this place. Um, and it looks like they've uh, brought a lawsuit against Trader Joe, the Dex on Avalanche and Arbitrum for using their name, which is absolutely hilarious to me. Um, and I know, Jordy, you're looking at bringing um, a Dex of a similar name, I believe, Trader Mo to Mantle. 
are you rethinking the naming convention here or are you talking to the team about this at all? This yeah, this is going to be the same team. So it's going to be an official, it's not going to be like a, uh, you know, a shitty fork. This, this is going to be the official one. Um, you know, look, the team's great. They're like one of the few AVAX protocols that has not gotten hacked. Um, they're not a fork, you know, they, they have their own version of uh, concentrated liquidity and everything else. So I think it's a good team. I don't know why they're just getting sued now. They've been around for a long time. I remember farming this thing back during the bull market. So whoever uh, is in charge of this grocery store, you know, maybe now they're uh, paying more attention to crypto for whatever reason. Yeah, it's funny because this is like a free spirited grocery store. Like everyone there wears Hawaiian shirts. They're all like crunchy, nice people. Like you would never think they'd be big litigators, but I'm curious if they go after Trader Mo now. Do you think this is like, this might be like an interesting question, but uh, obviously like the question was, okay, like from their side, like their perspective, like, was it worth, you know, being sued to, to name their decks Trader Joe? Um, I actually think it was worth it because I think Trader Joe, like during the bull market, it was like a really familiar name. It got them billions of TBL, lots of fees, got tra- like lots of traction and sure, like they might, you know, have to pay a fine or something, but um, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like they actually, like this was worth it, right? It's, it's like, it's like the reverse Martin Gale strategy of like, okay, like I, I might, I might get sued, but I will only get sued if we gain traction. So what do you, what do you guys think about that? They're, they're yeah. a decentralized organization, right? How can you see <laughs> that's, that's the maker DAO argument. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. What kind of uh keck do you have this week? Yeah. I, I'm going to quote myself on this one. Um, yeah. So I think like, you know, thinking about what happened with, with Dodd and AVAX and seeing how, you know, low liquidity and, low DeFi activities going on just across all, all at once. I, it reminded me very much of like these Chinese ghost cities where, you know, in order to fund their economy, they just like built a ton of these cities and like no one actually lives in them anymore. Um, and I, I just get the same vibe from this and also yeah, all the L ones out there and not just, you know, the Alto ones, even like the main one, like ETH is at like six G way right now. So. Very much like block space is very abundant right now for the met- metaverse citizens. It's a great analogy. I think all these buildings remind me of, you know, developers spending a lot of time writing all this code and making all these tools and then there's just no, like, nobody there. It's funny how the narrative changed, right? Like during the peak of the bull market, crypto can't scale. There's not enough block space. Like block space isn't a commodity. People will pay whatever they will, like can afford for ETH, but that's clearly all <laughs> gone the wayside and... Now we're looking at these empty cities. Yeah, absolutely. I think the A16Z like bull market comment about there not being enough block space. Um, right now there is. So maybe, maybe once there's new use cases, we might run out again. There's always a chance. Taiki, how about you? Yeah. So I, I guess this kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier around you know having like all these crypto projects, whether it be DeFi, NFTs, L1s. Uh, you kind of need all the cavemen to, you know, just get together and just like, you know, be hyped around community money or, you know, like whatever, like some some value around their project. Um, and I thought this was like pretty funny, um, like whatever NFT project trying to hire an NFT community babysitter, um, just bull posting every single day, you know, like this smells bullish, um, you know, fuck, screw the futters. Um, I feel like every team kind of needs, like, like ironically, I, I do think every crypto project kind of needs someone like this. Uh, even though it does sound pretty ridiculous. This is an epic job description. I think you need to read out uh, for our Spotify listeners a couple of these uh, tasks here for the community builder. Cha- yeah, so NFT community babysitter tasks, change diapers of bag holders when they start to cry on Twitter, feed and burp little babies when they get impatient and start footing, give them shiny or sensory objects to keep them occupied <laughs> when they get bored and have nothing to tweet about anymore. Read them bedtime stories about how bullish <laughs> you are. And this is a full-time job. <laughs> this is extremely accurate, I feel like. And ultimate CAC, this is a, this is a very strong very strong one. My CACs, I have a CAC A and a CAC B. They're both uh, related to the, to the AVAX uh, drama. <laughs> you know, this meme has uh, been used for different circumstances, but just given, uh, given, <laughs> given the drama... Um, you know, do you have protection? <laughs> he takes the picture of Amin and he says, we're already protected, baby. <laughs> so poor Dart has been killing it. Uh, shout out to him. The memes have been uh, ultimate. And uh, there's one more that Michael E. Polito 
give out. So, yeah, so Ippolito had a, a great one. Um, it's a Arrested Development, so hopefully uh, our, our listeners are aware of, of that show. Otherwise, it's going to blow a bit above their heads. But, you know, you have these, like, out-of-touch reach people, and this is exactly what he's coming out. He's just saying, like, it's just one hack, Michael. How much could it cost? $3 million? <laughs> <laughs> This is exactly capturing the uh, the essence of um, you know the reaction of, of the community and, and and myself. So, I think we outdid ourselves this week. Great set of kecks. I don't know. I, I feel like Taiki's kind of uh, came out of left field and <laughs> really it was very good. Taiki's won my <laughs> vote too. It's just too <laughs> accurate. I mean, it's literally factual. <laughs> it's just too good. Taiki, you win once again. Keck of the week for Taiki. Damn, I'm on like a winning streak. We didn't get thinking about that, though. The t- it could be a tiebreaker. Yeah, I like the Chinese ghost cities, too. Uh, it's so accurate. I feel like with all the VCs, right, it's just like all the investment goes into infrastructure, and then everyone forgets to build, like, actual applications. Um, and, you know, as a result, we have all these alto ones, like, just bleeding against Bitcoin and Ether in, per- in, like, in perpetuity. Um, yeah, and you know, something has to change at some point, right? Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next week, and I'm looking forward to uh, reading the comments you know, there are usually comments on Thicky's, you know, guns and his his good looks. I think we're going to get some haircut comments this time, Thicky. So you're, uh, the Thicky fans out there, go, go wild in the comments looking for <laughs> your reaction. See you next time, guys.